Hi everyone, and welcome to this video. Thanks a lot for watching. My name is David, I'm from the University of Cologne, and today, over the next 10, 15, 20, well, perhaps 25 minutes um, or so, I would like to offer a quick and hopefully helpful introduction to narrative perspective. I hope that I will be able to situate um, a discussion of narrative perspective within the larger field of narratology and to also offer a few thoughts um, about why it matters, what we can do with it, and why the study of narrative perspective um, is actually important. So without further ado, let's have a quick look at what we will be covering today in this video. We are going to start by looking at what narrative perspective is. So what do we mean when we talk about narrative perspective? Then we we'll look at some of the different narrative perspectives we can actually distinguish and analyze to then connect this to a quick discussion of different types of narrators. We'll conclude with a chat about why this is of interest for us as literary studies people. The question here is what to do with narrative perspective, why does it matter? Please note that throughout this video, um, I will reference and use as a source uh, Kine Brillenberg Wurt and Anne Rickney's book, The Life of Texts, an Introduction to Literary Studies, published in 2019 by Amsterdam University Press. So what is narrative perspective? Now, it may sound a bit like a truism to re-emphasize and reiterate in this context the centrality and power of narrative and storytelling for us as human beings. But I'll start doing so anyway, loosely quoting Cherokee writer Thomas King in one of his early short stories, who says, Don't you worry, this story knows exactly where it's going. So here's the thing. In one of his lectures, collected in the book The Truth About Stories, A Native Narrative, Thomas King powerfully summarizes the centrality and force of narrative, saying that, quote, The truth about stories is that that's all we are. Stories are wondrous things, and they are dangerous. For once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, it's loose in the world, so you have to be careful with the stories you tell, and you have to watch out for the stories that you were told. Acknowledging, as King does, that stories control our lives, literary scholars have maintained strong interest in how narrative is ultimately bound up with questions about what it means to be human. Scholars keep writing about the centrality of storytelling and narrative as a profoundly human trait. For instance, Mary Pomier Jones and later Joseph Gottschall, for example, refer to us as the storytelling animal. And the eminent American psychologist Jerome Bruner dedicated a great deal of his scholarly attention to the importance of narrative and narrativity in his work on selfhood and human cognition. Scholar Brian Boyd proposes a so-called biocultural approach to literature and storytelling in his book On the Origin of Stories, Evolution, Cognition and Fiction, a landmark study I suggest tracing our human love for and fascination with narrative in evolutionary terms. In Uses of Literature, Rita Felsky, um, for example, delivers a powerful discussion of literature as a space for the exploration of selfhood, employing a phenomenological lens to tie literary analysis, quote, back to the first person, clarifying how and why certain texts matter to us. These are just a few examples to illustrate the scholarly energy that continues to be directed at the study of what Kine Brillenburg Wurt and Anne Rickney call, quote unquote, the primacy of narrative. And at the end of the day, this small snippet only references, quote, Western academic output and or a, quote unquote, Western scholarly tradition. This body of work seems small, also, I would argue, if compared to the rich and ancient knowledge repertoire stored in indigenous epistemologies and cosmologies around the world, where the power of storytelling has been acknowledged and theorized since time immemorial. Now, equipped with this brief primer, let's get back to the main point of this video, what is narrative perspective? In their book, The Life of Texts, Brillenberg, Wirt, and Rigney argue that, quote, stories are a rich source of virtual experiences. Narratives conjure up a virtual world, often with unique characters, interesting settings, and exciting events that readers can experience in their imagination. Narratives give people virtual access to the world of other people's experience and have a way of triggering our curiosity about the life of others, end quote. They further suggest that, quote, fiction thus has all the characteristics of a game in which readers and viewers are invited to participate, end quote. Narrative perspective is then, well, all about the perspective from or through which we can do so. 
the perspective we employ in relation to the position from which we look at the story and the events. This is by no means trivial, and not as redundant as it may perhaps sound, because narrative perspective is, in this sense, all about the terms and conditions of our involvement in, experience of, and relation to a given story. If we take such an understanding of narrative as a foundation, clearly the issue of perspective matters a great deal. Because narrative perspective is about the question, who is speaking? Who is relating what kind of story and to whom is it being related? Which ultimately translates into the broader question, whose experience, no, whose interpretation of which experience of which type of reality is being related? Who gets, in any given narrative scenario, to tell their version of events? If we take Brillenberg and Rickney's analogy of fiction as a, quote, game in which readers and viewers are invited to participate as a foundation, narrative perspective is all about who gets to orchestrate the participation, on which terms and by which means. Narrative perspective is, in this sense, literally that, a perspective. The perspective taken and offered by a narrator or multiple narrators, not to be confused with the living and breathing author of a story. If narratives give people virtual access to the world of other people's experiences, narrative perspective becomes legible as part of the architectural grid of a given fictional world. Together with other elements like place, setting, time, and or all sorts of stylistic devices working to produce a unique reading, viewing, or listening experience. And if, as was suggested, narrative is a virtual experience, it is literally the perspective through which we will experience events and through which we will navigate this virtual experience. In this way, narrative perspective, like space, setting, time, language, style, rhetoric, and so forth, is a central and crucial framing device for not only what we experience in a story, but also how. As such, different narrative perspectives, and we will discuss some of those in just a minute, come with their distinct capabilities, but also limitations. Because after all, as the saying has it, it's all a matter of perspective, right? Narrative perspective is a prism through which experience is refracted, which means that it can also function as a significant constraint on what we as readers, viewers, listeners can actually know. Narrative perspective has a huge role to play in what we will likely be filled in on, Narrative perspective relates, therefore, to the crucial question, what can I know about the story? Because it tells me something about who the teller is, who is telling me the story, um, or through whose eyes am I actually seeing things? Even if the answer to this question is an anonymous, intradiegetic narrator who goes by a pseudonym, this will give me orientation and a sense of who or what I'm dealing with. This is perhaps a good moment to transition to our next area of interest. Which narrative perspectives can we actually distinguish? Let's have a look. We are probably familiar, likely from our high school days, with this threefold classification. We can determine, for instance, the so-called first-person narrative perspective or point of view based on the first grammatical person and identified by related personal pronouns, as can be seen in this example, the opening of um, Ellen van Nerven's Water. Here we are experiencing the narrative and its events, its virtual reality, to come back to Brillenberg, Wurt, and Rickney's analysis, through the eyes of the protagonist and her point of view, um, which is the angle from which we are witnessing the events of the story. The so-called second-person narrative perspective changes this a little in that it involves us as readers in a more direct and more immediate way by addressing us as the recipients of a story, the narrator's interlocutor or conversation partner. If narratives can invite readers, as suggested above, to participate, the second-person narrative perspective or point of view provides this by involving the reader as the addressee, evoking them as the audience a given narrative is being delivered to right now at this point in space and time. Here, the opening passage of Tat Chiang's story, Exhalation, offers a good example. As readers, we are being actively involved and immersed into the story by asking us to emotionally relate to the narrator to empathize with his condition and to follow the imperative he offers. We are a part of his story, in short, because we're being called upon. Last but not least, we can distinguish the good old so-called third-person narrative perspective or point of view, which makes us, to use the well-known analogy, hover above the action and the narrative's events as we're being told about them. 
So while the first person narrative perspective makes us, in a manner of speaking, follow along looking over a narrator's shoulders or seeing things through their eyes, and while the second person narrative perspective involves us by speaking to us or summoning us into the narrative, the third person narrative perspective makes us hover above, makes us inhabit a more or less distant location from which we see, evaluate, judge, and comment on events. So far, so good. We've looked at narrative perspective as a way and means to think about how we move around in a narrative, how and on which terms we relate to it, and to theorize our degree of involvement and or immersion. Understanding narrative perspective on an abstract level as the terms and conditions of our encounter with the narrative and the things it depicts, we've distinguished three types of narrative perspective or points of view that we're dealing with and in various combinations on a rather regular basis. But which different types of narrators can we distinguish and analyze, suggesting that narrative perspective and the narrators themselves are not necessarily the same thing? As Kina Brillenberg, Wurt, and Enrigny suggest, stories are conveyed by a narrator, who is not, again, to be confused with the physical author of a story, who has the important and complex function of walking us through the narrative, presenting it to us in specific ways that can be subject to change and modification at any time, and of holding our attention. As again Brillenberg and Rigney argue, describing the phenomenon of the narrator, the narrator is, quote, the voice we literally hear in oral storytelling and figuratively hear in written texts, end quote. As stories are conveyed by a narrator, as stories are related through a narrator in contradistinction to the physical performance or reenactment of events, for example, on stage, the ancient Greek term diegesis is used in literary and narratological theory to differentiate different types of narrators. The theoretical grounding for this distinction in Western literary scholarly traditions is ancient and originates in classical Greek philosophy, most notably in the works of Plato and Aristotle, and especially in Aristotle's work Poetics, or Peripoietikes, which is one of the oldest extant works of literary theory and continues to function as a point of reference to literary scholars to this day. If narrative perspective tells me something about how I am relating to a given story world, differentiating different types of narrators is all about zooming in on who is narrating a story to me and from which perspective. Who is speaking to me? Who am I listening to? Who am I dealing with? A good way to assess this is to think about a given narrator's degree of involvement. Narratologists like Gérard Genette offer us a basic, again, threefold distinction. We can, for instance, look at the so-called homodiegetic narrator, or homodiegetic narrators, who are, by definition, narrators who are also characters in and thus also participate in the story. A good example would again be Ellen van Nerven's character Caden, who is both the narrator and a participating protagonist who is telling us water from her first-person narrative point of view. Homodiegetic narrators stand, therefore, in distinction to so-called heterodiegetic narrators, who are by definition not themselves characters and participants in the story. Heterodiegetic narrators can employ different perspectives or point of views, but are commonly associated with the third person, and often, but not always, heterodiegetic narrators are the ones we call authorial or omniscient narrators. As Brillenberg, Wurt, and Rickney note, differentiating narrators means asking, quote, whether they participate in the action being narrated or not. Do they speak from a position outside of the world of the story, or are they a character within it?" End quote. Ellen van Nerven's Caden is not only a member of the story world, she also actively participates in the action and influences it in decisive ways. Whoever is telling me that in Claire Coleman's Tyrannalius, quote, Jackie was running, and that there was no thought inside his head except the intense drive to run, Neither speaks from a position inside the story world, nor do they participate in the action being depicted. We can also distinguish another type, so-called autodiegetic narrators, which are such narrators who, from a first-person perspective or point of view, recount their own experiences. Good examples are, for instance, Ashela in Ambulin Quaimalinas, um, The Interrogation of Ashela Wolf, and Beth in Ambulin and Ezekiel Quaimalinas, Catching Teller Crow. Both novels present the experience of their respective protagonists as told from their very own recollection. They are telling us their story through their eyes, as it happened or happens, for that matter, to them. And this is what distinguishes a robust autodiegetic narrator from a so-called witness narrator. First-person narrative perspective alone does not make a narration necessarily autodiegetic. 
Caden, as discussed, is a homodiegetic narrator delivering water from a first-person point of view. However, she is not, as Kine Brillenburg Wurt and Enrique Knee would ask of an autodiegetic narrator, quote, the main subject of the story. She does talk about herself, but arguably her role is more that of a reporter or a witness of events happening in the lives of others. No doubt water is all about Caden's personal transformation and awakening too, but I suggest that water utilizes Caden's active involvement in first-person perspective to focus on Lara Pinta and the fate of the so-called plant people, and how their story makes an argument about the state of Australian politics. Ashayla Wolf and Beth Teller, respectively, however, tell the story of their own life, as it were, as therefore autodiegetic narrators. Please note that this is what I would argue, and that this is of course a contestable reading or classification of these three example texts. And perhaps it is a good moment to note that the difference between, say, homo and autodiegetic narrators um, is not as analytically sharp as one might expect, and perhaps the difference is more one of degree and not so much in kind. However, I hope that this works to get across a general idea and to already suggest how and where to start an argument. To complicate things just a little more, let me stress that autodiegesis and autobiography are not the same thing, and that an autodiegetic narrator is not to be confused with an autobiographical narration, precisely because the term autobiography, strictly speaking, only applies to, um, as Brillenberg, Wurt, and Rickney argue, quote, non-fictional first-person narratives. And this could be complexified, specified, and problematized in a lot more depth. Avowedly, this is a quick introduction, so the aim here is to cover just a few essentials. Therefore, I am making an omission here in not talking about the different attributes that narrators could have, such as, famously and importantly, reliability and unreliability, and the issue of narrator visibility in general. Instead, I would like to come to a close reconnecting this discussion to the centrality and importance, the meaning of narrative for us human beings touched upon at the very beginning. Let me do so by asking what to do with this, what to do with narrative perspectives, and why does it matter? For this is not an exercise in classification for the sake of classification. This is not a lesson in how to name boxes and how to put things in them. The point is that, returning to Thomas King, if stories are truly all we are, we better have a few tools and strategies ready to analyze them if we want to come just a few inches closer to perhaps understanding what it means to be human and how and on which terms we relate to each other as human beings and the world around us. In this way, literary studies is not only a study of text and context, but the study of the profoundly human practice of making, negotiating, conveying and communicating meaning through storytelling. Analyzing and understanding, if and where possible, narrative perspective provides a coordinate system that can help us navigate stories, this ancient form of exploration. King cautions us to be careful with the stories we tell and the stories we are told. Investigating narrative perspective is a critical tool in our critical analytical arsenal to become literally aware of what's going on. And this goes beyond studying narrative texts, fictional stories, beyond the field of what we call literature. Decisively, this has a profoundly political dimension. Our 21st century is, among other massive scale challenges and problems, marked by a global resurgence of political conservatism and populism, and an over-availability of and oversaturation with information in this so-called golden age of information and content, enabled by the all-pervasiveness of digital media and their influence over our lives, thinking, working, learning, and communication habits. Relevance as a critical category is being hit hard by this oversaturation, and as politicians and big multinational corporations are waging war over our opinions and data, the question is how do we maintain critical agency in spaces of post-truth politics, and how do we maintain critical agency as human rights frameworks are being increasingly challenged in favor of unchallenged and short economic cooperation. I'm of course not suggesting that studying narrative perspectives works as an insulation against what Indian scientists and social activist Vandana Shiva calls, quote, the stupidity which rules us today. But here is the thing. Multimedia artist Paul Chen argues that art and the experience of art, and of course we include story, narrative, and literature into this field, quote, saves us from being conned. His point is that in experiencing how a work tries to convince us of its worth and its right to exist, 
We come to grasp how its aesthetic qualities echo in spirit and inform all the manipulative means by which people use reason to try to convince us of the value of what they are saying, doing, or selling. Therefore, looking at art or engaging with narrative, according to Chen, we are also engaging in, quote, in the practice of recognizing and evaluating elements of art as a cipher of how aesthetic is deployed socially and in general. Going to a gallery, as he argues, and by extension studying narrative, as I suggest, what we gain is, quote, insight into what makes something truly delightfully cunning, and in the process perhaps learn a little about the tradecraft of taking someone for a ride so that you might realize what is happening the next time someone is taking you for one. Narrative perspective is a critical tool to navigate a given narrative's coordinate system. Analyzing narrative perspective is finding out who is speaking, from where, to whom, for what purpose, why, and on which terms. Analyzing and reading this coordinate system enables a critical appreciation of narrative texts and stories, but is just as much a central aspect of information literacy. Thomas King and now Paul Chan in mind, then, we can see how a case can be made for why narrative perspective matters. Thinking about and using narrative perspective as a tool of analysis helps us resist manipulation and being tricked, co-opted, or deceived. Unless, of course, we willfully, and on purpose, seek the distinct ability of great stories and great art to lure us into the deliberate suspension of disbelief and remind us about what, as Chen suggests, Quote, a form that authenticates what is most human about humanity, end quote. Thank you very much.